All right, welcome Becker Vineyards family to another Facebook Live week 76. Uh, this is called the Taste of Talent. So uh, wines exclusively produced from the grapes from Talent Vineyards. Uh, so love to welcome everybody tonight, uh, along with our owner, Dr. Richard Becker. Uh, glad to see your beautiful faces as, as always. Uh, then we have uh, Kaylin Hall, uh, master director uh all that fun stuff uh that does all the behind the scenes and and uh, also helps bring this to life and then myself uh bobby totten the wine club director here at becker vineyards uh so tonight the uh the lineup of wines we have are the 2017 Cinso, uh the 2016 grenache and the 2017 Malbec Reserve, all produced from Talent Vineyards uh, grapes. So uh, great lineup, and that is exactly the order that we're gonna taste through. So tonight I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to uh, Dr. Richard Becker for some beautiful insights and words that he always uh, graces us with. So uh, go ahead, Dr. Becker. The most beautiful word would be that this pandemic is over. But I uh, guess for 76 weeks with this wonderful company that, that I've I'm blessed to be with. Uh, and uh, again, just remembering uh, and thanking all the people who are fighting this battle. The battle's not over. Uh, we're back to 2,000, approaching 2,000 deaths a day in the United States. Just terrible. Uh, fourth wave. Just do everything you can to protect yourself, protect your family, uh, and get vaccinated if you possibly can. And uh, I want to I want to just say what this is a treat. To, be drinking Drew Talent's wines. You know, uh, I've, I've said this before in the past, but uh, w one thing that I really enjoy is that Drew, Drew Talent and I uh, both had great great grandfathers in Mason and Brady before the Civil War. Probably both cowboys. I guess maybe Drew's real uh, historical ancestor was maybe a farmer, but uh, and Bobby Totten is a, a descendant of a, fa a famous Texas Ranger, Silas Totten. And uh, Kaylin, I haven't taken your uh, history on this on this point, but uh, uh, but it's it's uh, I, I think the great truth about it is that none, none of these people were thinking about grapes and wine in 1859, and uh, it's fun to have this association and just uh, with with all of you, and to have and to make some wine from uh, from Drew's incredibly beautiful vineyard. I think one of the very best anywhere. Yes, sir. And, uh, so uh, anyway, my, that's my salute and thanks, and um, uh, let's let's proceed. Yes, sir. Uh, so this uh, we're going to start off with the uh, the Senso, which so beautiful. I mean, uh, I've been out to Drew's place once, and uh, like you said, it is a gorgeous uh, gorgeous piece of property. Uh, I mean, we've been to the top and looking down on the vineyards, and and it's just uh, he does such a, a wonderful job and. Every uh, the few times I've seen the Senso come in, the, the grapes are just so huge. I mean, they're just they're just so uh, swelling, full of like flavor and just just amazing. I think they're table grapes that come in, <laughs> but uh, but the, yes. the wine that's produced out of this is just phenomenal. This is probably one of my favorites right now. Same here. Um, you know, I want to the, the historical history. The historical note about this is that. Uh, since I was an ancient grape in France, probably uh, from even maybe before the time of the Romans, known as Herault, H-E-R-A-U-L-T, uh, grown primarily in, in the region in the south of France near Montpellier. And it's had a long history, at primarily, I guess, as a blending grape, a great component of many of the red Rhone blends. Uh, crossed with Pinot Noir, it, it forms Pinotage, or uh, Hermitage, as, as it's called in South Africa, a very... Uh, a prominent grape there, so it's it's wonderful to see this uh, being grown so well. And uh, what struck me so much about this was this, along with some of the other uh, lesser known red Rhone grapes, uh, it, when these when these were in barrel uh, from from 2017, they were so good uh, that uh, even though they stayed in barrel for two years, they still are incredibly delicate. I mean, this look, you you would think. A wine could be this delicate, this gentle uh, on the palate and the nose, uh, and, and had, had spent two years in a barrel. So uh, it's um, it's wonderful to, to see it and taste it. And Nicole, are you joining us? 
She's connecting. Okay, good. There Hard she is. Think. Oh, by the harvester. Awesome. <laughs> That's beautiful. Good, uh, That's cool. Yeah. Nicole, fire that thing up and let's harvest some grapes. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Tis the season, right? Rides. What was that? Should we charge for some rides? I think we <laughs> should. Well, uh, Kate, let's talk about what, what you're what you're smelling, tasting, what, what yeah, you're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. So this is one of my favorite wines um, on our current tasting menu. And I was really excited to see this whole lineup. Um, the Cinso, when it first came out, it came out, you know, alongside the, the Carignan and the Cunoise. And I was astounded by how much um, strawberry I got on the nose. There was little delicate notes that were um, maybe they remind me of something herbaceous or floral. Um, and I still get some of that, maybe, maybe some violet. But on the palette right now, I'm getting bright red cranberry and pomegranate notes. And there's something that um, reminds me a bit of graphite um, on the back end of it. And I think it's just so wonderful. It's um, mighty warm here in the Hill Country today. And this is a perfect red wine to enjoy um, in, in, the, in the September heat, I suppose. But it's, it's beautiful. It's presenting lovely. Agree, agree. Nicole, what are you getting on it, Bobby? The... Oh, <laughs> sorry. I said, what are you getting on it, Bobby? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I was going to hand it down to Nicole. I was going to. Nicole, with the good words, what have you got on the Senso? It's got a nice, uh, a nice earthiness to it. Kind of, um, kind of reminds me a little bit of plowed earth. Um, and then there's also a little bit of a minerality that's a, uh, um, it almost reminds me like granite, maybe like a little bit of a granite minerality. And I would say a little bit of uh, like cooked, uh, like cooked strawberries, like you're making a, a compote of, so of sorts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think also what's fun is it's a very light bodied red, but it has some nice complexity. I mean, you taste it and go, oh, okay, there's some, there's a lot going on on this wine. I agree. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're, we're tasting two grapes that are, uh, very prominent blending grapes uh, in, uh, in the Rhone Valley or in the area of Chateauneuf du Pop. And um, they both have a sort of an intense strawberry note, a, a fruit note. Uh, and you could see how nicely this might go with Syrah or with Mabed, which are, which are very den much denser. Uh, and the same is true of Grenache. We'll get to that in a moment. But uh, uh, it's wonderful to have it uh, not, not blended. You know, it's almost like it's in the direction of a Syrah. And uh, uh, this is just a beautiful job, I think, by John and yes, Rachel. Sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. No, and I, I agree. Like, this has got a lot of layers to it. I mean, the, the fruit is still so prominent uh, mm -hmm. after the, the few years that, that it's been out now. And and uh, but, uh, I definitely getting that earthy notes and I'm getting a little bit of that that cocoa and that that espresso on the finish it almost kind of reminds me of like chocolate covered strawberries uh so it's got you know just it's a beautiful layers to it what would uh, well, what would you like to have what, what food would you have with this Caleb how, how do you pair this so I think my favorite pairing I've seen this with was with a, a, a poached pear and arugula salad. Um, and it's phenomenal. Um, the spiciness of the arugula and the earthy tones that you get in the arugula also, I think, kind of highlight um, some of the fruitiness that you get in the wine. Um, I also feel like I would be very, I would be pleased as punch with um, maybe some brie and some of the strawberry fig uh, jam or preserves that uh, yeah. Michael makes. <laughs> I think that would just be delightful. Uh, today at, uh, at lunch, we had a very nice wine writer visit us and uh, we made lunch for her. And uh, the first course was that uh, Michael and Sean made was uh, smoked salmon uh, with uh, cream fresh and uh, dill and basically on, on blennings and uh this would we we had uh, 
uh, Kunwa said this, but this would have been just fab also. Sounds amazing. Have we ever produced a standalone since so before? No, no. I don't. I don't think anyone in Texas has done these these three uh, grapes by themselves uh, that, that I know of that I've ever seen. They haven't been grown much, really. And uh, I think when they're when they're around, they get uh, they get uh, blended away, not to make very nice Rome blends. But uh, it's really interesting to taste this by itself. Seventeen was, as we said so many times, was a really great harvest year with very late, slow ripening, and uh, we got complex flavors that. Uh, uh, and many of our grapes, uh, I think, also express, especially expressed in this one. Right. And what made Drew Talent want to plant this at his property? What made him want to grow it? What inspired him? I don't know. Some of the, some of his his findings came uh, after we we talked the first time, and uh, that was wonderful. And uh, I don't. You'd have to ask Drew. I don't know if this is something that I that we suggested talking about. You know, more things to do with Rones. I think he was struck by how well Rhone grapes were doing in, uh, in his part of Mason County uh, in that wonderful sand that, uh, that's there. And uh, so I, I just don't, that's all I know. I can't, I can't remember more. Um, and this is a grape that likes the sun too, right? Takes the heat really well. Um, I think so, like, sure. Uh, places in the Rhone, uh, Texas, or, or even like uh, Languedoc Roussan. Yeah, well, I can only tell you that, you know, that, that the Rhone is very much like the hill country. Uh, the last time I was there, I was there for a week, and it was uh, over 102 every day in the first week of July, first week of July. So, um, you know, if you think that there are cool European conditions, uh, it, it wasn't that week in the, in the Rhone Valley. Wow. So their, their, their grapes held up. That's amazing. Um, you know, as this wine is open, I feel like I pick up some violet notes. Uh huh. Yeah. So this this is a grape that's been growing for thousands of years in in that part of Europe. So the people have have thought a lot of it, protected it, you know, and uh, not lost it. And uh, it's fun to it's fun to fun to have it growing in in uh, uh, Camp Air, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and growing so well. No, it is. It is. It's so beautiful. Was this the first time that we've uh, we introduced Sinso to our our wine program? To my knowledge, yes. Okay, never blended into anything else, or uh, we may we may have had some in the past that we blended into into our. Uh, our own blend, our coat roti, or right, uh, yes, yeah, I believe so. That's amazing. This is so cool. I mean, it just it's fun to be able to to showcase something that not everybody is is uh, is familiar with. Now, with the the Sinso, doesn't it usually have an L in there as well? Uh, a ULT. Either way, they say you can spell <laughs> it. Okay, but typically. Uh, to answer your question, the majority of the time you do see it with an L, yes. Okay. So I, I also feel um, that I must comment on the ABV on this wine. It is, re it's relatively high. And from smelling it and tasting it, you would not um, be able to discern that it's sitting over 15%. And I think that's something that's also pretty incredible. Um, the fact that it doesn't come off as hot in any any sort of way, um, it's it's certainly a, an interesting little wine. I just wanted to comment on that. That's true. Sometimes when you have the high alcohol wines, you can also kind of feel the esters kind of like tickle underneath your nose. And you're right, this one doesn't do this at all. It's very uh, it's very polished. It's a very polished wine. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, love the balance on it. You know, do we know how much your French oak John talked me out of for this uh, this wine? <laughs> Anybody remember? I would bet quite a bit. <laughs> um, I have the blend sheet here. Give me just a quick second to pull it up. Um, so on the tech sheet, um, it was only twenty three percent in in new French oak, 
um, we did a, a combination of new and uh, one, two, and three year American oak on it for the vast majority. And a very small amount was um, aged in tank. And um, it's here is at 100% Senso also, which I think is um, interesting because I know that the Kunwa had a, a little bit of a blend to it. I believe that there was less than 5% that was uh, Cab Sav. So I think it is really fun to have it here as a standalone 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 <laughs> i agree all righty bobby where do we go from here just from here we're gonna transition over into some uh some grenache okay okay and uh we've gotta we've gotta remember to uh remember to uh you know have something paired with each one of these wines at the end. So uh, well, I'm, I'm already covered on my first one. I'm covered on the same <laughs> You nailed it. I mean, I, I don't know how I could, uh, you know, compete with that one. All right. So this is the 16 Grenache from uh, Talent Vineyards as well, and sitting at 13.8. So. Oh. Well, and I feel whenever um, this wine came out, I, I feel like I was enamored with other wines at the moment and never really visited the Grenache. Um, and through these virtual tastings, we, we've done this one, I think maybe once or twice. Um, it's incredible. And I'm disappointed in myself for not realizing that sooner. Um, I, I, I just, I think you get so many baking spices on it, but there's also... Um, more green herbs that I catch on this wine, especially today. I don't know if my nose is different today um, or if it's just because uh, I opened the bottle approximately seven minutes before the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is so bright uh, today and I think it's just absolutely beautiful. What are you all catching on the nose? I, think I always get orange notes. Pardon me, Nishi, go ahead. I think I pick up a lot of anise you know, kind of uh, anise, and it also has kind of a, a candied, uh, candied aroma. I could see that almost um, candied red fruit. I would catch on that. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe a little bit of basil, maybe some basil notes on this. Yeah. And it also has maybe a little bit of like a like a beef jerky. It has like a dried, a little bit of a dried beef characteristic to it. Mm. Not, not very intense, just kind of subtle. Mm. What, what, what's the technical blend on this? Uh, okay. So the technical blend on this, are you ready? Yeah. Um, this has got 85% Grenache. It's got 11% Malbec and then 4% Viognier. So um, I think on the Viognier, they do that to kind of maybe bind some color perhaps. Um, but I think that's really interesting um, because I mean, I know 4% is not a lot, but um, I would not anticipate that on this wine and I'm not getting anything overtly floral or um, um, super fragrant or perfumed like I would catch on um, I think Viognier normally. Um, so it's, uh, fruit coming from it's let's see here 96 percent from drew talent there is a little bit of that viognier coming from the farmhouse vineyards uh, um, on the oak it's predominantly aged in american oak 75 percent in american oak both new and neutral and some neutral french oak as well so not, not too much on that French oak, Doc. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. <clears throat> I've always loved the Grenache from many places, from Texas and from Spain, uh, the Grenache, and uh, uh, from the Priorat. It's just, uh, it's just oh. fabulous. Um, and it, uh, my favorite Grenache it does have a lot of orange notes, kind of orange zest, maybe some candied orange. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
is and there's, there's a trace of this, and it can be more forward or less forward. Um, and I think it has to do with uh, the the darkness of the of the of the wine. Uh, my favorite uh, uh, Chateau de Pop is, which is maybe a, almost 100 percent Grosch. It's very light in color. It's not it's not different at all from the color of the Senso we just tasted. And uh, we've and some years in Texas we've we've had it that way, and some years not. So, um, uh, but this is quite nice. It also reminds me of uh, like some of the wine Giguandas too, um, which I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, some people consider it like the little brother to a uh, uh, little brother to Chateauneuf de Pop. Exactly. And Drew tells me that this is always one of his the hardest grapes for him to grow. And uh, has lots. He's had lots of problems with it, and has changed it. Maybe changed clones, changed stock, uh, trying to find just the right formula for it. Uh, it's, but it has grown well for him. It's also grown well uh, for uh, in the, in West Texas around um, Plains and uh, uh, that part of uh, of our of our providers. Um, so uh, what, what, what are you going to have with us, Kaylin, to eat? What's going to be your dish? I, um, oh, that's a little bit harder. Um, <laughs> for some reason, I'm on a, uh, a, a, a roll of wanting to eat lots of cheeses and charcuterie. Um, oh. I think it's just been a few days. Uh, but I feel like some lovely manchego would go really well with this. Um, but even something a little bit heartier maybe some beef stew or um, beef and barley stew, something along those lines. Um, but I could even see this going into a dessert as well, like gingerbread, which a little risky, but I think it'd be beautiful. <laughs> that sounds amazing. That sounds so good. But yeah, as this is opening up, I feel like I'm getting a little bit more, um, perhaps like cinnamon, um, maybe um sugared uh, um I, I think nicole mentioned candied i'm picking up on some of that now now that mine has had some time to breathe and <laughs> I've swirled it enough <laughs> yeah yeah i think you're getting that that little bit of that orange zest almost like a candied orange peel like yeah. a like exactly a yeah right it's beautiful it's kind of subtle now it's kind of getting a hint of like almost like an evergreen mint, like a kind of a, a mint characteristic that kind of uh -huh. yeah. just sneaking up in there. Absolutely. There's also a little bit of a, a chalkiness um, in the mouthfeel too. Uh, also another, I would say more like a secondary description, a little more on the subtle side. That's Mason County dust. <laughs> 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 Very sandy. Mm. Yeah, the, the the terroir. It's beautiful. It's beautiful wine. So I know that the last time that we had the Grenache was 2012. Um, uh, is it that long ago? It yeah, was. as a standalone, yeah. Yeah, standalone, which I think that one was so silky smooth. That was kind of almost an introduction into the me transitioning into red wines <laughs> that was, yeah, uh, yeah. Was, uh, Grenache. Yeah. and uh, well, such a beautiful wine um, i saw some down in the cellar the other day and that was a wine that was gone before i arrived at that at working at becker so i'm very interested i'm just yeah, putting it out <laughs> Laying all the cards out. <laughs> I'm interested. Um, but I was, um, this past Saturday, I did a library tasting for a group and um, got to dig through some wines. And that was something I came across and was hoping that uh, we had enough. And I only found a few bottles. And I thought, oh, man, well, rats. And, uh, <laughs> you know, went around, went on my way. And then um, the next morning, I was tidying up some things. And I discovered not a super significant amount, but a significantly larger amount than I had discovered previously. So it may be worth exploring. 
because I think it was a part of the wine club member wines, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it just brings me back to the <laughs> first joining the team. Uh, it's, uh, I've heard incredible. many good things about it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But this is uh, this is beautiful. I remember that uh, that night, uh, Dr. Becker, that uh, you asked. Uh, we hadn't released the Grenache yet, and you were enjoying uh, the uh, Valentine's dinner a few years ago. <laughs> and uh, in in the middle of the Valentine's dinner, you'd said, "I guess you sent Chris Beckman over to go ahead and get some uh, some of the Grenache to share with the guests." Uh -huh. and, uh, I was just finishing closing up over here. And I was like, I know exactly where it's at. Let's get on that forklift and get a get a couple cases uh, for you ready to go. And uh, and then that was when we released this new vintage of the uh, the Grenache. <laughs> and was it the sixteen? Was it this? Yes, sir. This year, uh, yeah. Well, uh, and you know what what to eat with this? Um, you know, one of the great pairings is is uh, uh, goat uh, barbecued goat. And wow. uh, um, I, 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 you know, we travel all over the world with Tom and Lisa Perini, and and I've told, I've told this story before, but I was just thinking about it again. That we were in a little town in Spain, and we found a on Sunday it was raining, and we found a restaurant that uh, they were they were barbecuing goat, and they had all the local wonderful Grenache, and uh, then some Tipperino, and it was uh, it was a great a great Sunday experience. Wow. You had to be there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know there's a yeah, I drumble fire. Yeah, <laughs> no, there's a place in uh, next to Mason Brady. They do their uh, annual goat yeah. cook off out there. So, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll load up a couple of bottles of Grenache, go up there, and do our own investigative journey. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> is Henri still in the Caprito business? Do we know? Is he? No, he sold out. He sold out and moved to Oklahoma. That's a horrible situation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, uh, is, uh, I can't remember if he has two grandchildren now or just one, but yeah, uh -huh. he moved you know, He and his That's wife. Good. That's wonderful. Yeah. Wow. Good. Henri. All righty. All right. Um, shall we proceed to the Malbec? Let's do I it. I think we shall. All right. Wow. Well, it's uh, the meaning of Malbec is interesting. The, the name uh, can be uh, uh, associated with the Hungarian winemaker who introduced it in France. Or it could mean bad kiss. Or it could be a bad kiss by a Hungarian winemaker. But uh, <laughs> so, that's where the name comes from. And uh, this ought to be very good. So the very first thing that I got on the nose oh. was something earthy. Um, but I almost want to label it as beets. Oh. Mm -hmm. I also pick up like some tobacco and also like a little bit of olives, like a, I'm trying to decide if I want to say uh, black olives or if I want to say green olives, but there's kind of a, an olive characteristic. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, dried leaves. It has like a dried leaves uh, characteristic too, and maybe uh, some mulberries, like some mulberry fruit. Uh huh. Nice. I don't know that I've ever had a mulberry. That, that's on my list of things to investigate. Well, you could have one at our house in San Antonio if the squirrels would eat them all. They wait, they sit up there and wait for them to get ripe, <laughs> and then they get them. And, and of so we never see. It's hard to find a ripe one. Um, uh, 
sneaky. I, I, I always like the, the dark chocolate, the coffee, and, and which is kind of at the core, at the heart of Malbec, I think. Um, so, there's a little bit of like a tart, like a tart uh, Bing cherry, I think, as uh -huh, well. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, yes. And it's a beautiful wine. Over mm. Well, and I, I think it's interesting too how much the color variation differs between these three wines. Um, this Malbec is inky, purpley, and beautiful. The Grenache has got that lovely brick red, and then the Chiso is uniquely so light and bright. Right. Um, I think it, it's, it was easy for me to tell apart these three red wines, which is not always the case. <laughs> no, exactly. No, I think it's a perfect. Yes, ma'am. And this one's been aged almost, is it almost two, is it 20 months or two years in the oak, in the, the French and American oak barrels? I think so, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. This one, this one was for, for two years and I've, I've pulled up the tech sheet for this one. And um, this one is 86% Malbec. It's got um, a little bit of Merlot, a little bit of Cab Sav and a little bit of Tanat, which I'm wondering if that li li lends to the, the, color profile of this wine um and it's all going to be from drew talents vineyards um and there's the the list of oak on this wine is um pretty incredible um so i'm going to just say that we've got 73 percent in american oak and 23 percent in and varying french oaks and um i don't know that i've ever seen an oak list this long guys on any of them i've seen numbers of these sheets <laughs> uh, but yes so round numbers and i know that that did not add, add up to 100 the two numbers i just said um and that's because there's an oak type that says other becker blend so i don't know if we had specialty <laughs> oak barrels made or what that is so um that would be the remaining four percent so that could be probably some type of combination of um, different oak barrels or perhaps a promotional barrel from a, um, a cooperage. And I remember, uh, I remember Drew, uh, Drew's daughter, when it, um, uh, she was in Uguay and, uh, was talking about, Hey dad, I think you need to plant some Tanat. And he thought about it and I think kind of, uh, put it to the side for a couple of years and then, uh, decided, um, I don't remember where he actually got to try some. I don't know if she brought some bottles back for him. And then later he decided to plant it. And uh, I thought it was pretty cool. And then I had been to Uruguay and he had been asking me like, does this remind you of Uruguay? And I was like, yeah, actually it does. And that's how he kind of told me the story about his daughter getting him interested in it. Um, but I'll have to say it, it, um, it always, um, yeah, it never, uh, to not never seems to lack for color or, mm -hmm. Uh, tannins. I know sometimes it can be really aggressive for for uh, for because uh, it never strikes me as a, a full-bodied red, but um, but even for a medium-bodied red, it can be can be really aggressive depending on who's making it and how they're working with it. Right. It's the winemaker's cowbell. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. So, if you have a beautiful symphonic piece going on, uh, like the senso or um, others you hate to add cowbell in i mean you, you could do it but uh it's just it's you know it's not for me yeah so i will say um the other i don't know a couple of weeks back drew was at the winery um and was was going through and doing some barrel samples with the the winemaking team and i crashed that meeting mainly because i had never really had an opportunity to connect with drew and i wanted to have some conversation and and we did um but i was able to also try the tanat out of barrel and i was pleasantly surprised um because you know tanat tends to be the cowbell. I will say that John and Rachel have done a phenomenal job of producing a Tanat, which standalone out of barrel did not um, rip all of the enamel off of my teeth. It was like there were, there were tannins, they did exist. They were not subtle by any means, but they were not astringent to where the wine was not enjoyable. Um, so that's just 
just something. I know where the barrels are, Doc. I, I saw them. <laughs> <laughs> really good. A couple of them. <laughs> no, I, uh, I I ran into to Drew. I guess it was a few weeks ago. He was dropping off his uh, his Chardonnay, and he had a gentleman with him, and and he wanted to show him down down in the cellar, and uh, and saw saw that one of the rows is Tanat from from his vineyard. And I said, "Hey, this is uh, this is some of your Tanat here." And uh, I just want to mention that it's it's beautiful wine. It's it's so great and it has so much depth to it and so much body. It's and, and it's uh, it's got a big personality for a lot of us big you know personalities here in Texas. And he said, "It's my kind of wine. I I love it." <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm glad that we can uh, we can get uh, get that from uh, from his vineyard and and he enjoys doing that. Yeah had some guests a few years ago that they thought the name to, uh, talent was the name of a grape and so they were calling it oh man we have some talent and i was like well uh you're welcome to, <laughs> you're welcome to try it and then um i said but it's uh that's actually the name of the grape grower his name is drew talent oh, oh okay and i we just sort of had a, a, a rush of people that were saying talent oh we want some talent and uh <laughs> And, you know, when he pops in like that, Bobby, he's always like, hey, how's the wine doing? You know, how's it tasting? Are people liking it? And so I had told him about that and he just kind of shook his head. He didn't know what to think about it. But we also have a mutual friend named Gwen that also is from Mason. And uh, when she ran into him, she said, hey, I want some of that Talant, you know, those Talant grapes. And he goes, I, you were talking to Nicole. And uh, I don't know, his wife, uh, Drew and his, and his wife, Laura, are probably watching now. So they're probably shaking their fingers at me right now but uh but i thought that was pretty cool that's, <laughs> that's awesome excellent that's i'm gonna so save that fun. <laughs> but yeah. favor, the people were they were engaged they were interested in it and um they just they just assumed that it was um um not not an english word not a name they thought it was the name of a grape that's cute well that's yeah. like the canada family people thought the grapes were from canada and uh, we're making it down here. So that's, we had to have yeah. that's still okay. true. I, I frequently, whenever I am, you know, presenting, I'm like, oh, this is the yeah, yeah, from the Canada family vineyards. Their surname is Canada. They are from Plains, Texas. They're our neighbors to the north, but not that far north. And, and perfect <laughs> for people saying it <laughs> and being confused. <laughs> I so I do want to mention that I um, did open some 2010 Malbec the other day, and it was from Drew Talent's Vineyards, and it was still beautiful, and it was very much intact, um, and and it was it was quite lovely. That was a part of the library tasting that I did on Saturday, and um, it's really fun to see how this wine, the 2017 has the potential to age into that. Not that this is not beautiful. They're beautiful in both different ways. Um, but it was, it was very exciting to try, um, that wine that's been, you know, at least harvested 11 years ago. I don't know how long it sat in barrel before it was bottled, but it was, it was still intact and still absolutely lovely and just drinking beautifully. Well, He's got a beautiful property too. I, I got to visit uh, with some friends a couple of years ago, uh, just to, to go see what it looked like. And uh, um, uh, we all hopped in one vehicle and uh, he toured us through all his different blocks. And then I guess it's right there on the west side. There's a little bit of an elevation, not real steep, but it has a really cool layout of his whole vineyard. But um, he's modest in his description, um, but he it's just always well manicured, very well taken care of. Cool. So, do we have any dishes uh, that you recommend, Nicole, with uh, with these wines? I guess for the Sanso, it kind of made me think of like uh, tuna steaks, you know, like cracked black pepper, and then just kind of put it on the grill. Um, I think the Grenache. When you you were mentioning Prio Rat, I remember being uh, uh, near that area uh, when I was in Tarragona, Spain, and um, there was a spot overlooking this uh, overlooking the sea and it there was a salad called the uh, España salad and so I thought well when in Rome do as the Romans do and, and try it and I think it was a 
like a calamari, like a fresh calamari salad. And that would actually go really well with that. Uh -huh. uh, and then even uh, one of my favorite cheeses is uh, Oso Rati. You know, it's a, it's a, a cheap cheese from uh, 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 Southern, uh, Southern Pyrenees there. It's really, really good. And um, I guess for the Malbec, let's see. Um, I know it's easy to say like ribeye. And I, I think it was because I had a ribeye last night, um, but it had <laughs> the right amount of uh, like the, the, the wine itself is pretty lean. And then the ribeye has um, a little bit of a fattiness to kind of offset uh, the lean. And then, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of some more. Um, uh, maybe even like some Italian food. Like if you're doing like maybe a, like a, maybe like the, uh, meatballs or um, something with uh, something that's not full not full on hearty but has a little more a uh, little more meatiness to it. Oh, wild game! I think it can do uh, maybe like some uh, um, quail or even like squab. I think would be good. Would be good. Yes. Yeah. Doctor Becker, what do you think? Well, on which topic? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. All the wines are beautiful. What what would you like to pair with uh with with the wines? I'm, I'm liking the the uh, the blini and salmon with the uh, uh senso and uh, uh, uh with the uh, grenache uh, the cabrito and uh, uh and with this fabulous with the malbec. Um, I think maybe something something we we had in in um, Argentina, which would be the the, the wonderful grass fed beef. Would go very well with this, I think. Yeah. Wow. Did you have that where they did that? Um, where they put the beef like a like a sign of the cross over the, like they put the that metal rod, and then they kind of leaned it over the grill. Oh, I'm sorry, leaned it over the coals. Did you get to have it like that when you were there? I didn't see that, but uh, the way however they cooked it, they brought it out. It was fab. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I had that guest chef at Buffalo Gap too, right? Francis Maltman yeah. come out yeah. and do um, Argentine um, uh, cooking. Like, I, I thought it was interesting. I did. I've never met him. I have one of his cookbooks, but um, you know, as a classically trained chef, and then uh, later in life decided to do um, kind of work the grill a little more with some simpler foods, but just having quite the oh. touch. Yeah. It, it was uh, yeah, he was great. To, uh, I met him a couple times, and uh, and he loves poetry as well as cooking. So, uh, oh wow! He likes, talk, he likes to talk about that. But uh, in his restaurant, at, the first time we were in Argentina, uh, you know, tasting the the grass fed beef that was so good there, reminded me of the beef I had growing up in Abilene when I was you know ten years old. And it has a completely different taste from from the uh, corn, the stockyard fattening that goes on now. <laughs> and but between the first time we were there and then maybe ten years later in in Argentina, the taste of the beef changed. And they were now doing the, the fattening and and you know like the rest of the world. But it was it was a great thing to remember uh, tasting real grass fed beef uh, that was very well prepared. He's a great chef. That's amazing. Were they changing like to like a, a European or American palate on that to adding more uh, corn or did they just have, was there like a shortage of grass that particular time? Or? No, I think, I think they, it, it's, it's the, they changed the American technique of uh, 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 fattening with corn. Yeah. Um, I wish we wouldn't do that, but I, I'm not in that business. So I can't do much. Oh. No wagyu. <laughs> <laughs> well, gosh, Bobby, uh, this was fab. What, what are we tasting next week? Uh, it looks so, pretty exciting. Next week, so this week being the taste of talent, next week we are doing the collage of Canada. <laughs> That'll be fun. Yes. So we've got 2017 Chardonnay Reserve from the Canada Family Vineyard. We have the 2017 Canada Family Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve, 
and then a library wine, the double gold winner of the uh, 2015 vintage of the Canada family Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve as well. Uh, so I think it's going to be a great lineup. Uh, get to showcase Brenda's uh, uh, Brent, great work that Brenda does, the fruits of her labor in the, in the bottle, which is, uh, she does a great, phenomenal job. And to taste the cantaloupes and the watermelons and all that stuff that come in, it just, <laughs> it's always extra special to, uh, to us here at the winery as well. Absolutely. I also We're wanted friends. to yeah. say happy harvest to everyone in the, uh, in the Texas wine industry. So that's why I've got the I'm uh, parked, by, uh, parked by the harvester today, just uh, kind of, uh, we're in the harvest season. It's been an unusual harvest, but just wanted to say um, happy harvest and thinking of all the people that are working the odd hours um, to get the crop yeah. in. Great wines. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. So, cheers, see you next week. Cheers, y'all. Have a good Wonderful evening. evening. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. We'll see y'all next week.